think this one is going to be a lot of fun. I'm not going to spill any of the details, though. I'm going to let you guys find out for yourselves why this one is going to be fun. So I'm just going to introduce our speakers, and we'll bring them up on stage, and we'll let them do their thing. So this should be, this should be a good time. So uh, first off, uh, we'll bring up Ryan Orsi. He's the director of product management. Uh, he's got experience with wireless networking, IoT, and cellular. I'd like to pick his brain about cellular stuff sometime, because that's an that's a, uh, a realm that I don't know anything about. Also along with him is uh, Jim Steinbacher, who is a technical evangelist at WatchGuard and uh, is extremely stylish, as you're about to see. Let's bring up on the stage Ryan and Jim. Come on out. Hello, everyone. That came out nifty. That came out really nifty. That's nice. All right. So, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Ryan Orsi, Director of Product Management for the Wi-Fi line at WatchGuards. And I'm Jim Steinbach, the Technical Evangelist for Wireless. Can I get a hallelujah? hallelujah. And can I get a selfie, guys? Hey, Jim, hold on. <laughs> Stay right there. Stay right there. Let me get you, buddy. There we are. Hands up, guys. Hands up. And this side of the room, too. This is for social, so hopefully you're okay with that, guys. <laughs> awesome. Well, hey, we're here to talk to you all about um, something, an area of research we've been doing for, gosh, a couple of years now. And uh, it's a very, very important area in, in our minds. You know, WatchGuard is a security company. Uh, my background, as you've heard in the intro, is, is very uh, antenna science, RF, electromagnetism. And I joined WatchGuard to lead their product line, wondering why would a security company suddenly care about Wi-Fi? And along the way, I've learned a lot, and I've learned that we need your help. <laughs> we need your involvement. Um, into potentially something that uh, we might have thought have been kind of closed book many moons ago. I don't think it is. And you're going to hear from Jim as well. It's, it's not a closed book. So <clears throat> one of the things to really kind of kick our discussion off is not Dropbox. Shame on you, Dropbox. <laughs> Nor is it that other one is that Wi-Fi hacking, right? This is an area, being a security company, we constantly look at attack surfaces and attack vectors and something called the kill chain and where threats could be prevented at what layer in the kill chain. Wi-Fi hacking is absolutely all around us, usually in public spaces more so than private spaces, but it's moving into private spaces as well. And the reality that we all face is if you've ever connected you know, to a public Wi-Fi, and I know in this room, everybody knows the term VPN. This discussion is not about VPN, um, just to kind of clear that out of the way. But if you have not used a VPN, or your significant others, or your children, or your aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters that aren't so technically astute as yourselves, they don't typically use VPNs. Actually, only 5% of the US uses VPN connections probably have been exposed to some nasty things on public Wi-Fi. And if you've escaped so far, right, the, the thing about this message and this area of research is we've learned, you know, going and doing many, many presentations around the world about Wi-Fi hacking, where is it in the media? Where is it on the front page news? It's not actually covered that well in the media. And that's also because we need more members in the community actively researching this with us and, and contributing. What we're here to really t talk about is about a standard about a, a protocol standard that needs to be readdressed. And we're, kinda, we're here to kind of um, bring you into this concept that we've been building up for a while, but the Wi-Fi industry, right, at a protocol level, doesn't really have a sufficient security standard for layer two security when things just have MAC addresses and things are associating at that level. We don't have a great standard there. For 20 years, I know we're celebrating the 20th anniversary of Wi-Fi, Six Wi-Fi threat categories, you can kind of group them together. They are still alive and well. And in, in our world of cybersecurity, if we were on stage talking about ransomware or a, a Trojan that has no signature for, for 20 years, we'd be laughed off stage. <laughs> but this is true. They're the, the same tricks and things that worked 20 years ago still work today in many of the same cases. And now the layer seven vulnerabilities and, and exploits have gotten more severe. Anyone can learn how to hack, right, Jim? Yep, absolutely. Go to YouTube, search Wi-Fi hacking. You'll probably see a little bit of us on there telling you how to, how to keep yourself safe, but you're going to more so see how to hack, what to buy, what tools to use. We'll show you some of that as well during this presentation. 3.3 million plus videos. Good stat. 
on how to hack Wi-Fi. If, it, if it's not a hot topic, if it's not a, a topic of interest to everyone, you know, you'd see three. <laughs> Very good point. So uh, when we started going around a few years ago talking about Wi-Fi hacking, we would ask members of communities like this what they thought Wi-Fi hacking was, and we realized everyone has a different vocabulary term. Um, it's, it's interpreted different ways. So we've coined this, this idea called the Trusted Wireless Environment. It's a, it's a framework, really a technical framework to help us all, as technical people, kind of hone our conversations into, oh yes, the, the threat vector I'm talking about today belongs in that category. Let's talk about how it works and how to shut that attack vector down. So it's really a technical definition, and it's what we would like to see get more support for to become more of, a, of an actual standard or some flavor of it become a real standard in the Wi-Fi community. And again, it's addressing layer two Wi-Fi security. And it's to protect the world in red, not just protecting your corporate enterprise users, but people like my mom, <laughs> like Jim's family, right? We don't have, and, and, and I'm sure all of your families, unless you're uh, teaching them all the great teachings of Wi-Fi security, they don't always know how to keep themselves safe. For instance, we did a, a webinar a while back, and I actually had my mom live on, on a Skype call and told her just be prepared for anything. I just asked her very simply, what, does, what do the letters VPN mean to you? And she thought, thought it was Valentine Party Network. Right? That, that represents right, the kind of level of technical expertise of somebody walking into a cafe, a hotel, they're on vacation, and we're talking about protecting not just your corporate users, but everybody, the entire world even the non-technical people. So um, we often get, uh, get a lot of, a lot of uh, feedback from our own cyber community uh, among our peers when we talk about this chart, right? You all know that the model. Everybody knows the model. Most cybersecurity companies, and we present at Black Hat and DEF CON and those kinds of shows all across the globe, is focusing on layer seven, right? Layer seven exploits, ransomware, worms, denial of service attacks things that are, are high up in that stack. Wi-Fi attacks initiate, right? The initial attack begins actually very low in that model. And it's fairly wide open when you start looking at it in detail and you start looking at not just secured corporate networks, which I know are probably much more better designed by people like yourselves, but the general wide open space that is Wi-Fi networking out in the world. So <clears throat> why is there a picture of a toothbrush on the screen? Because I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to create a, a mental image for you all, right, about, about what we're missing in the industry, and we really, really want your contribution and your voices heard as well. With this toothbrush, people know it's safe to buy and safe to use, and it shouldn't be uh, causing any harm to them chemically because the American Dental Association has tested it to be safe. When you use your credit cards, you have some kind of good feelings that, that when you swipe that credit card, the place you're swiping it at has been certified to be compliant with PCI standards. There's some kind of test. In the world of PCs, laptops, notebooks, endpoints as we call them, there are plenty of antivirus, malware, intrusion prevention kind of tests and laboratories out there that specialize in can this particular asset be protected from threats X, Y, Z, and so on. For Wi-Fi, there currently is nothing standardized. And I think that's a big gap. And that's where we want the community to really start to uh, uh, interact a bit more here. Jim, do you want to introduce us, please? Yep. So in, in all of our uh, research, et cetera, we, we did come up with what we think are six categories for Wi-Fi threats. The challenge that we all are facing, one of them is what this term might mean to me might be different than the way you're using it. So one of the first things we've got to do is to make certain that when we talk about, for example, a rogue AP, that we all mean exactly the same thing. For us, a rogue AP is a, a broadcasting device that's plugged into your network. We need to know, talk about the attacks. An evil twin, AP, what is an evil twin? Basically, I'm broadcasting your SSID and wanting you to connect to me. Obviously, crack, dragon blood, those threats are things that you're familiar with right now. The sad thing is 
that all the not notoriety around those particular hacks, while great from a security perspective to raise awareness, actually lowers the confidence level on the part of the customers, your customers, your peers, into WPA2 and WPA3 as security. What's a neighbor AP? We, we define it as the guys that are broadcasting over there. They're not part of my network, but I need to be able to categorize them with absolute certainty that they are not a rogue, that they're not an evil twin, and that they are my network, because I obviously can't disrupt them. Uh, what's a rogue client? So we call a rogue client um, a device that has connected to a rogue AP or an evil twin, right? Uh, here's my authorized laptop. Great, I put it out. I don't like the Wi-Fi, the corporate Wi-Fi. I connect to Starbucks over here, and then I come back. Well, how do I know as the network administrator that you know that you actually connected to Starbucks? Maybe you pick up malware. We don't know. So we categorize that actually as a threat. Ad hoc networks can be a threat as well, right? I want, I'm trying to impose corporate security on all of the information that's stored on my network. What I don't want to have happen is you sharing that without going through the controls that I have in place. I've got them in place on my wired network. I need them in place on my wireless network as well. And finally, this is the accidental piece, a misconfigured AP. An AP gets sent out, maybe it's to a remote site or whatever, and it's misconfigured in such a way that either it has open authentication that where it shouldn't, or the passphrase is wrong, or something. But that misconfigured AP creates another opportunity vector for someone to actually go in and attack your network. I already heard a complaint on Twitter. You're running a damn karma attack. Yes, yes I am, right? We're all Wi-Fi professionals. It's child's play, right? What do I do? I happen to have a Wi-Fi pineapple running. You could be using, you know, Cali, you could use anything that's set up to, to create a karma attack. Hacker listens for your SSID that's going out in your probe request, copies it down, uses those, rebroadcasts them with open authentication. Your client, your smartphone, auto-joins the network. We don't think about that. We might, right, because we're the wireless professionals. But the folks that we're putting our networks in for don't think about that. And that's the first personal tip, right? Don't ever uh, auto-save the SSIDs you connect to on your clients. That's uh, yeah. personal tip number one. <laughs> and don't auto-join, right? So don't if you go down to the second layer of settings, on um, Wi-Fi settings on uh, Android, the newer Android, the default setting is, if I'm near a Wi-Fi network, turn the Wi-Fi on. If I'm near a strong signal. You've got to go in and actually select, no, I don't want to do that. Right? Most of us in here are aware of that. But once again, security isn't about us. Security is about the people who rely on us to keep them safe. Are you my home network? Yes, you are. Okay, I'm home. Great. An evil twin AP, right? It's broadcasting right now. It's broadcasting Starbucks. I love to broadcast Starbucks because everybody has been to a Starbucks. And most of us have actually connected to Wi-Fi on Starbucks. So I can go to any city in the world. And the fact that there's 13,500 Starbucks in the U.S. and another 13,500 in the rest of the world, odds are I'm going to get someone on, with a karma attack. And it's also, the, I'd say, the nastiest one, right, Jim? Right. Of the six, you, saw, you guys saw that slide, uh, crack and dragon blood. The attack starts with a man in the middle position, which typically you're spoofing the MAC address of a legitimate BSS ID. And that is an evil twin, right? So if your systems are not detecting that happening, Mac spoofing, evil twin association, you're, you're taken. You're right? caught. You're caught. And remember, most people's phones, for example, aren't encrypted. So once you've connected, if I'm live hacking you, 
I can go in and take a look at, just rummage around, see what's in your phone. Grab contacts, grab email addresses, grab credit card numbers. Whatever is stored in there, eh, there's a good chance that I have access to it. But also remember that if you've connected, all that data, that data stream is flowing through the pineapple. Pineapple does a great job of logging. It'll just log and log and log. And if you get the, the 2.4 only, the little guy, the nano, it'll run for almost a week on a beefy little battery. So as the hacker, they just go and put it somewhere, hide it behind a wall, set it in a closet, and let it run, and then have access again to go back and grab it. Right? We, these are attacks that have been around for 20 years, and they're still around. And we are vulnerable. Because when we leave our hotel room, we had, maybe we had our Wi-Fi on upstairs, and we walk down here, and then you get caught with my karma attack. Which SSID is real? I don't know. And your phone doesn't know either. So we've seen these in the attacks in the media, right? Oh, no. WPA2 has been cracked. For over 10 years. <laughs> oh, no. The Russians, the bad guys, they, they, they used these attacks, legitimate attacks, to get in and get real information from the UN doping. Did you guys see that news when Commission. it came out? Sh show of hands. Couple. See, it, it, it th in the back, but it doesn't make very far widespread news, does it? Right. And we're, we're the security guys, right? And they were literally putting these things in the back of cars with log periodic antennas, pointing them at hotel conferences like this at people like us. Right. Ca capturing authentication uh, and credentials. And that's the other thing to remember. And when I go out and talk to folks, they think, oh, the, if I'm being hacked, it, they're hacking me right now. But that's not the case, right? All I'm going to do is I'm going to collect the data, and then I'm going to go back home, and I'm going to look for the low-hanging fruit, username, passwords, email address, and I'm going to run a dictionary attack against them. And, oh, by the way, that's easy to do. I don't have to brute force it. Cause, and once I get that information, I don't use it. I sell it for 25 cents, a name. You're talking about the dark web, Jim. I am talking about the dark web, Brian. There are sites that we all should be checking out. The first one, Seclicity.org, is one that WatchGuard puts up that has current threats streaming on it all the time. NVD, also a, a threat database, as is CVE. So if you don't check those on a regular basis, you should. What you'll see is that, oh, there's a whole lot of, th of, of uh, uh, threats related to home uh, routers. Well, yeah. How many of you have been in businesses that have a home router as one of their access points? I know I have. We're not all big corporate giants. There's lots of mom and pops out there, your corner store, that are running these kinds of devices. I think I'll grab that for me. Hmm? Uh, our proposal, guys, for a um, <clears throat> high-level proposal of what would, what would an environment of this hotel have to have in place from a technology perspective to successfully prevent those six attack vectors that we just talked about, that Jim covered, right, those six. And those are, those are the categories. If you can find more, I'd like to know about it, right? But those are the six nasty ones that lead to data exfiltration and personally identifiable information being taken outside when it's not supposed to be. So installing technology that meets three checkbox requirements. It's not too much rocket science, but the first one is the performance and everything that's been discussed so far in this conference and the performance of a WLAN network should not be degraded because you, put, you brought security into that environment. We deal with this in other parts of the technology stack in our world. We deal with it in UTM firewalls. We deal with it in antivirus software on machines. You can't put something how annoying is it, right, in the old days when you put antivirus software on your laptop and then it crawls? You can't put something into the network and it make it crawl, but you're super secure. Who, who's going to want to buy that, use that, maintain that network? The second one is management. Um, I, I've been loving the presentations about cloud management. This exactly speaks to that. But as practitioners, moving your security policies for Wi-Fi security can be touchy 
If you're going from controller to controller or network to network, you need a consistent security policy, perhaps to fight and counteract human error. I know that never happens in this room. I've never made a configuration mistake myself. But uh, that, that's the reason why that requirement is there. You shouldn't have to replicate manually your security policy for Wi-Fi onto different networks that are just that are your control. And the third one's probably the most important. It's black and white. It's yes or no. It's a binary answer. Does the WLAN infrastructure automatically detect and automatically prevent those six threats? And any one of us can do those six threats. We're going to try to demo maybe two of them for you today at the end of this. But it's not rocket science. It's layer two stuff, right? So we can pop open Kali later. We can have some fun there. But this particular test is just making sure your WLAN equipment can auto-detect and auto-prevent. And that second one is really important because I'm sure you've had the experience. Who was I talking to? Uh, Heather back there. Where, where, where'd she go? There she is. Dealing with large conferences like Black Hat being the Wi-Fi provider that ruckus is out there, she probably has to deal with this junk way more than we've ever had to in, in, our, in our world at WatchGuard, right? But uh, that's what we're talking about. The system can automatically take care of this for you because it gets beyond human possibility to respond quick enough to stop data exfiltration and personal identifiable information leaving when it shouldn't be. Um, <clears throat> we do have a suggestion here for you all, and uh, that, that site, secplicity.org, a great site to submit to us, by the way. You can submit an article, submit uh, a research paper to us. We'd love to, to take that and, and post it and put it on social and interact. We have um, a little demonstration here on a video, and then I'll also try it in this hotel, because I don't actually know if this hotel has evil twin prevention. Does it? I don't know. We're, we're going to actually show you how to do that. It's very simple. Uh, the, way, the way we've been doing this at WatchGuard with our, our sales engineers and our resellers around the world is uh, go into an environment, bring your pineapple. You can get a pineapple nano online for like 99 bucks. Only hack yourself. So I'm going to use my phone, and this is only going to be allowed for my phone's MAC address via MAC filtering to ever associate to it. So no one else can ever associate to it. And what you do is you first associate your phone to legitimate Wi-Fi network, and then you turn on your pineapple and broadcast the same name. If your phone stays connected to it with no association dis disruption, there is nothing watching for evil twins. And you could say that, that site, that location failed the test. It's black and white. It takes five minutes. A lot of our folks have been doing it on the move through airports, at, right. me at meeting halls like this, train stations, corporate offices, <laughs> outside a bank. <laughs> You'll see this very interesting one. We've currently up to about 40 tests, five different countries, uh, 38 different big brand businesses. I won't name names with most of these. Um, only four locations passed the test. Ironically, they were all in the UK. Where's the, whoo, there it is. <laughs> Ironically, they were all in the UK. So what, whatever, whatever Ian's been spreading in the UK is, 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 is taking off over there, apparently. Um, this is an example of one that did not meet the test, but it shows you exactly what it looks like. And again, I'll, I'll try to do it here for you as well. It's an easy test to do, and we would love you guys to get more involved and try doing this yourself and begin thinking about this in your designs for your networks. So um, let's go to watch this video. Hi, it's uh, Megan, and I'm on the prowl again, as I'm still in Leeds. I'm sat on the street opposite yep. Barclays Bank. Yes, I'm actually opposite Barclays Bank. They're closed at the moment. And I'm actually, just to show you, let's have a look. There you go, Barclays. Lovely summer afternoon. So let's do the TWE hack. You know how it works, basically, if I go into my filters, it's only my phone that is connected to it, so there you go. And we're going to go and do the hack on them. So this is a bank. You could expect them to have some security, let's hope. So here we go in and update on that one. Obviously I'll turn my Wi-Fi off my phone, and we wait for the little green message to go away. It's gone, and now turn it back on again and we wait for it to join back to their Wi-Fi. Let's see what happens. I'm waiting. There we go. And boom, there you go. 172.16.42.174. So, Barclays, you have my money. 
You have free Wi-Fi, but it's not secure. That's not good. I'd expect better from a bank. There you go. See you later. Bye. Just a, just a quick example, but he, what, what he did, right, was he, he authenticated his client to that. It's an open SSID, right? So that's, he's now a known client connected to that system. He just broadcast the same SSID, did not even spoof the MAC address or the BSSID. Didn't spoof it. Just turned, just turned it on, and his client, the reason why he turned his client Wi-Fi off and on is because what a real attacker would do is do a deauthentication attack, send some deauth packets to the client, which would force him to you know, disconnect from that SSID, and it'll look for the next, the next AP to jump to, and that's going to be the pineapple. And it'll stay connected for minutes, but I don't want to waste your time just watching the, watching the screen. But that's it. That's pretty quick, right? I've, has anyone in the room tried doing that before? Three? My, my count three, right? Four? Four of us. All right. So that, this, is, this is our mission, Jim, is to get right. more of these folks doing this. And, and I'll point out that the other thing that we should do and be, be publicly advertising that we've done it is... You know, I, I'm fortunate enough to get to travel um, through all different parts of the world. So I'm in airport lounges. I'm in airports themselves. I just go in and I do a scan, right? I use Adrian's tool. I use someone else's tool. And I scan what's in the, the RF space right then and there. And I will tell you from personal experience that 90% of the time in the airports that I'm in, I see an evil twin operating. How do I know it is? Because some of these guys aren't very sophisticated, right? I'm running uh, in this, this hotel or in this airport, I'm running uh, Aruba, right? They don't even bother to spoof the address. They're just spoofing the, the MAC address. They're just spoofing the SSID. And so I encourage you all, whenever you're in these public spaces, take a look. See what's there, right? Constantly be checking and and take snapshots and post it on social media because we are the force that can make this change. And we, right? we need the media to wake up. <laughs> we need our, them to our take it. corporate overlords truly have had 20 years to do it. And nothing, there is no public security that exists. You know, we talk about WPA3 and, and our peers even, uh, not the... the Wi-Fi peers, but our other peers, think that we're going to be secure because WPA3 exists. Well, you know, if I'm an evil twin and I'm running WPA3 with a simple password on it, you can connect securely. So now you've, you, but you still are connected to an evil twin. Well, and and more, more importantly, just the, 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 the evil twin can downgrade to WPA2, and WPA3 has a, has a backwards compatibility spec in it, right? So that's going to be an easy, easy one to, to defeat. Uh, what Jim said about the airports. So as, as you guys fly back home, check out the airport that you land in. Try it. My hometown airport, San Diego, California, got bad press a few years ago. It was the most insecure airport in the U.S. because there was an active evil twin when it wasn't WatchGuard. It was some other security company went through and surveyed like 50 U.S. airports. San Diego was the most insecure. So I keep posting on social every time I fly through there, like, hey, you haven't fixed it yet. <laughs> uh, but I, I encourage you guys to do that. Um, you know, you're, you're only testing yourself. You're not touching their data stream. We've had the FBI in the audience a few times. As long as you don't touch the data stream, you're fine. All right? So do, I highly recommend you checking this out. Now, what, what we're tr trying to paint, the, the, the future view of this, right, of if you do build that trusted wireless environment, or you do put in technology and configure it in a way as a part of your design to auto-detect and prevent those six threats. From a technical level, this is sort of what things would be looking like. You have your APs plugged into your switch fabric. The AP is most likely the device or the thing, but it can be other devices possibly in, in the local network that's actively scanning the wired side, so your ethernet side of your network and all the VLANs that's visible, and the wireless airspace, so everything within range. So it's scanning both sides. It's going to be constantly monitoring for those six threats. It's going to constantly be breaking over-the-air client associations involving those threats. So that's its mission in life. Is it, if it detects a threat in the air, it's going to send the authentication frames like a madman until that client device gives up and moves on. And it's neutralized the threat, and the threat will go away. 
or it's going to block wired side traffic. So if you have, say, an attacker, bottom left, right, one of us messing around pen testing a network or a legitimate attacker, and you have some office equipment, some laptops. If the attacker is a wise guy trying to plug something into uh, an Ethernet port they found in the waiting room of a hospital, or uh, yeah, an Ethernet port in the movie theater that, that the IT guys messed up and left open. If they try to plug something in with Ethernet, this device, this technology, most vendor products can do something like this, right? If you configure it this way, you should be implementing a block right there. Now, some of the technologies that actually prevent that wired side traffic are things like ARP poisoning, tar pitting, basically destroying the traffic originating from the attacker, just neutralizing it, wiping it out. If the attacker comes in with, like you saw our, our friend Martin from the UK, right, with one of these things, not physically cabled to your, your network, it's the evil twin, right, it's in the air, the device needs, a, needs an 802.11 radio to communicate 802.11 to the attacker and send disassociation frames. Spoofed disassociation frames are the most effective, right? So the, the, the security source would spoof a message saying, source of the attacker, destination victim, please disconnect. And source, victim, destination attacker, please disconnect. Over and over and over every couple milliseconds. That will, that will cause the client's algorithm to give up on that and move on. So you've neutralized on, over the air and on the wire kinds of attacks. Tons of ways to implement that, right, Jim? Yep, absolutely. Every vendor does it differently. They do. Or they don't do it because, as we argue, right, there is no standard for vendors to develop to. <laughs> so that's why the terminologies and the vocabularies are all over the place. The end users that you service, they don't know what they're even up against, right? And, and us practitioners have to come together and help define that standard for the industry, or we're always going to be developing it in different ways with pros and cons and Yeah, with the outcomes. advent of, of Wi-Fi uh, uh, in six gigahertz, you know, we, we have an opportunity there to start fresh, right? As Keith was saying this morning, we're not bound to everything that we've done in the past to repeat those mistakes. So maybe that's the opportunity that we take to really promote collectively that we develop better core security for wireless signals. And when this is built, my favorite part, it's mom friendly. There is no software she has to download on her iPhone or iPad when she goes into the cafe or she uses the guest Wi-Fi at the hospital or the doctor's office or the, the dental office. She doesn't have to download an app. She doesn't have to answer certificate warning messages about 802.1x authentication. She doesn't have to have a username and a password. She doesn't even have to have a, a password for the Wi-Fi, right? Anybody and everybody will be safe when you build it and design it that way. So that's kind of the, the, the hopefully the aha moment uh, is that it can be done. It can be done. We just haven't done it as an industry yet. And when I came into WatchGuard and figured this out with Jim here, I was like, come on. <laughs> yeah. There's got to be a better way. And that's why we're here, right? The, the idea is to start with you, right? We've talked to customers. We've, we've tried to get movement. And we've got, I don't know, the, the, we're going to show you in a minute, trustedwirelessenvironment.com. There's a petition there, an electronic petition. You sign it. That's not associated with you know, watch guard, we're not doing anything with it. However, by signing that, we believe it's the first step to getting us to move forward, getting Cisco, getting Aruba, getting uh, uh, Meraki, getting everyone to start really thinking at a corporate level of, all right, security is not a competitive differentiator. <laughs> Security is a must. Our customers deserve security. They deserve safe and secure Wi-Fi. And when we can't rely on them to do it themselves, we, the professionals, have to step up to the plate and really get moving and coordinate together. And that's why we threw that up there. TrustedWirelessEnvironment.com. It's just a simple petition. Sign it. And we're hoping that this will help start to move this conversation along. You'll only get 12 shampoo advertisements every week. Yeah. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal.
But honestly, if you've ever signed a petition outside the grocery store for stopping the Amazon being burned to death or, you know, clean oceans, like that, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to collect signatures, honestly, because folks like Patty Murray, we were in Capitol Hill earlier this year, uh, meeting with her, we're going to be meeting with other senators to raise awareness. And my, my, my topic when I raised my hand was, yeah, we would like to talk about, you know, Wi-Fi security for citizens in the U.S. And she said, oh, yeah. We get briefed every week on different Wi-Fi security threats, and this week we were told never to go to <clears throat> insert very large fast food restaurant here ever again because of Wi-Fi security threats at these places that only the government knows about, right? That's not making, it's not bubbling up. So we're actively working with some of her, her folks on how to help get some of the, so the buy-in also from uh, not just from you know, private industry and commercial and industry like here, but also on the government side. Jim? So, Wi-Fi you can trust. We came up with that logo. We could have somebody else have another logo, but that's what we want. We want something that identifies that this network is secure so that everyone and their mother can literally, when they look at their phone, see that it's secure. Not just a padlock. The padlock's bogus. We've, we've, we've proven that all, all the time. So what we've got now is the couple of demos. So yes, I'm going to show you that as Wi-Fi professionals, you too can get caught with a karma attack. Uh, but the easiest way also, if you're doing these, if you do take our advice, do the evil twin tests as you go away, and, and even your, your own office environments, check it out. Post your findings on the hashtag trust your Wi-Fi, LinkedIn, Twitter. That'd be a great way for us to stay connected on here after we leave the show, because we were constantly monitoring that hashtag. Here's some links and resources, right? I mentioned uh, uh, NBD and CVE down there at the bottom. Those are the URLs. If you haven't gone there yet, if they're not saved as a favorite, they should be. Um, and trusted wireless environment, trust your Wi-Fi. Those are our LinkedIn, Twitter handles. Um, so you can start yelling at me on Twitter for doing the karma attack. <laughs> All right, folks, so uh, what I wanted to show you was, uh, let's actually test for an evil twin protection in the room. Let's check it out, right? So let's do what that guy in the UK did. Uh, apparently the only country that knows about Wi-Fi security. <laughs> let's actually check this out. So here I've got, let me make sure my phone is working. Not you. You. Why are you so tiny? Here we go. Let's see if I can make this a bit bigger. Trust computer, da, da, da. all right. So on here, we're gonna be connected. Right now I'm connected to, uh, let me forget this one. There is one here, Opryland Convention. There we go, make sure we're associated. Give me a little check mark. And pay attention to the IP address, right? 172.21.207.92. You guys got photographic memory? Remember that, take a picture. And all we're going to do is fire up the Pineapple Nano, right? Just plugged in. Let's give it a second to boot up here. Why did you die? Come back. There we go. And this is exactly what Martin was doing in the UK. Fire it up. Get inside of it. when it's done booting. And you don't need a pineapple, by the way, folks. You guys know how to broadcast an SSID from something portable. That's all you need to do. There are some Android apps that can do this for you without, without uh, needing to, you know, I'm still waiting for, for Apple to not, not be jailbroken and allow you to do this, right? But you can, of course, broadcast from, uh, from any kind of radio that you have that can allow you to do that. Come on, baby. Come alive. Here we go. So you guys can actually see what's going on. There's no karma, there's none of that stuff going on. I'm just going simply to the network side and oh look, I was messing with San Diego airport Wi-Fi before. Let's type in, case sensitive, right? Opry land convention. Did I get that right? Looks good. Give it that little chance for that green to go away. And 
let's flick this thing off, pretend we got D off, flick it back on. Let's see what we're associated to. Still 207, let's give another shot. Still 207, so the dauth isn't working yet. It's possible that this does have protection. Now, let's go a little step further, folks. Let's actually go into, let's turn this on for a second. Let's spoof the MAC address of the BSS ID. I had this happen to me at another event recently. Let's figure out what we're, that's what we want. Oh, come back. We just want the BSS ID. We're gonna spoof it inside the pineapple. Make it an exact copy evil twin, right? Thank you very much, that's all we needed. 9C, 1C. One, two, eight, eight, D, eight, nine, six. Come on, Come on baby. Come on. Keep thinking. All right, nine C, one C, one, two, eight, eight, D, eight, nine, six. Exact copy. So if there is evil twin protection, then this still will fail a few more times. Let's check it out. Twenty-one two zero seven. Hey, perhaps somebody updated the config because they knew we were coming on stage, Jim. <laughs> now I'm actually really happy to see this, folks. Is what what happens is you get connected to the pineapple, right? Because the client does is not making any kind of yes, any kind of uh, advanced um, advanced decision on what it's connecting to. So this room is secure from evil twins from pre offended from clients that are already known to the system. The system is configured to recognize that this is illegitimate. So somewhere in the management console for this hotel, they're probably seeing right now, you know, spoofed SSID or spoofed MAC address as a message, and the radios are actively preventing my client from connecting to it. Switch over to the, the uh, Tetra. By the way, the karma attack that I was running is running on this device here. It's not like I was hiding it from anyone, right? It's in plain sight. Um, that's how easy the threats are, right? We, d we just don't think about it all the time. And if we're not thinking about it, who is? Yep. Right? Now, I'm not going to actually show you that one because you're, you're unplugged, man. But okay. what, I, what I do want to show you guys is the most fundamental one of all, which is a rogue access point, somebody plugging something into your network and finding that rogue access point. Most every vendor's UI has something about rogue something, right? It's, it's kind of a, uh, a misused term, which, which, is, which is unfortunate in the, in the wild, right? But what I've got on the stage here is a simple dumb switch. It's all flat, there's no VLANs, everything's plugged into one switch. I've got a couple of APs on that, on that, that switch, and I've got an Apple Airport Express off the shelf broadcasting the SSID called, this is a rogue, SSID, or a rogue access point. <laughs> Very clever, right? It's powered, but it's not connected on Ethernet to anything. So in a second, um, this is kind of highlighting why we need a standard, because vendors can implement things a million different ways, and we all have. We all have implemented what we feel, right, is very, very basic of just, yeah, here we go, this is a rogue AP, that is this Apple. What we feel is a very basic configuration of rogue AP detection or prevention is actually how, do each, how does each vendor really do it? Totally, you know, whatever the engineering team feels is the right flavor of ice cream for the day. So if, uh, if I take a second and go check out these management consoles, right, for these APs, let me While you're doing this. that, I, I will mention that we all know that when we go to turn WIPs on in most manufacturers' consoles, there's a nice big warning that says, oh, no, no, you might not want to really do this. And even if you do turn it on, yeah. you've got to constantly, manually maintain it because there is no automatic, true automatic, fully categorization of all the threats all the approved APs, all the approved clients, that doesn't always happen automatically. Right. 
right? It's, it's unfortunate for practitioners, it's, it's confusing. What, I don't wanna turn this thing on because it's gonna tell me I'm gonna get in trouble. So what I'll do here, right, you guys are looking at uh, uh, an air marshal screen here. Uh, it's monitoring for SSIDs. There's no rogue SSIDs. Currently, this is correct, right? Because this is a rogue AP, it's currently just a neighboring SSID. But the minute I do this, let's get that nice click in there too. Oh, I didn't click. It clicked. It clicked. The moment I click that into the network, it's wired into the switch, I promise you. You guys can come and check it out. It should show up. If it doesn't show up in a few seconds, then it's, it's actually highlighting the implementation of the rogue detection on, on that particular vendor's product, right, is done differently because there is no architecture to code to. It's, it's whatever the engineering team wanted to do. The reason why this is used, this Apple Airport Express, is the MAC addresses of the Ethernet ports on the LAN side and the MAC addresses of the radios differ more than five bits. That's, that's cheating the algorithm. So if you, if you want to go beat any rogue AP detection, you just make sure your wireless radio MACs are more than five bits different than your Ethernet MACs. And that should not be the case, right? It seems like a very nope. wide open hole. Um, we also, sorry Aruba guys, it's just the APs that I have. I've been checking this out on Aruba too. And remember, it's not, it's not meant to be a competitive smackdown. It's just, this is what we research, this is what we see. And uh, so, some do it differently, some do it better. Um, this is not a, you know, a full featured, you know, everything turned on. But this is a rogue AP is also considered interfering on that side as well. Um, we do have our own stuff as, as well, right? And uh, we do it a bit differently. The rogue AP should be showing up here pretty soon. But Perhaps. the key is, there needs to be coordination, right? Yes. This is not, Can't no longer can we afford for security to be a competitive advantage or disadvantage, right? It's, we're the professionals, let's, let's get together and truly act like it. Let's force our companies to pay attention to wireless security. Let's force our manufacturers to actually start talking with one another and coordinate. Let's get the standards bodies, whether it's uh, Wi-Fi Alliance or IEEE or both. Let's work together to come up with right. what the appropriate standards are that we can all share commonly. Something as simple as a rogue AP shouldn't be able to be defeated by having five bits different on your MAC address, right? So that's, that's the purpose of that. That's what our research team does. We try to figure out ways to, to detect things like that that are wide, wide gaps. Not everyone knows that little trick, right? So that's just, um, if you plug in a regular device, you'll get detected. Yeah. But you do that, you don't. Again, we really would, uh, would love to see you all um, join that website. You won't get the shampoo advertisements. I was just joking. <laughs> but uh, start to do those evil twin tests and start thinking about that when you do your designs as well. Because you can do it with many different products. It doesn't have to be one, one solution. is not the kill-all solution. But we do need to start talking about it and we need to change the minds of the media because that's going to be able to start changing minds of the people investing in R&D and really start to build a more of a cohesive standard that everybody could develop towards. Exactly. I think we're out of time. Um, we are. Thank you all for your time and attention. Appreciate that. Uh, any questions, anybody? Did we flip to that? Yeah. Oh, whoop, Ooh, we got Lots of questions. Woo. Wow. Lots of questions. You guys are using the upvote feature. I like that. All right. Should we start at the top? Do you guys just want to do Q&A on your own, or do you want my help? No, we, you guys probably got it, right? I could read. Sorry. Yeah, go for it. How about <laughs> it? 802.11w was supposed to have fixed some of this despite near zero clients supporting it. What are the other issues with 802.11w? Uh, yeah, I, it's, it's, it's sad that the, the adoption never really hit on the client side like it should have, right? Um, why? I, mean, I heard that that protocol was a bit heavy on the resource side, and that might have hurt, you know, widespread adoption, uh, just processing power. I think it should be re I think it should reevaluated. Re I mean, what, what do you think, Jim? Yeah, I mean, if if no one if you don't get full compliance, then there are still security holes, right? Yeah. And so, while some of these things become optional, when they really should be mandated, you know, um, and so I think all of this process needs to be reconsidered, and and find the ways to really push forward for consistency across all manufacturers, um, both from a WIPs or a security perspective uh, for clients and for access points themselves. 
And that, that last one up here, look, they tried whips in this very hotel. Look what happened to them. I have a problem with the term whips. Our marketing still uses the word whips, but define whips for me real fast. <laughs> there, there's, no, there's no technical definition of exactly what it does, how it works. Yeah, I get, <laughs> I get that too. Like you're lassoing and whipping people. Uh, it's, it's kind of an abused term, right? And that's what we're trying to say. Let's, let's replace that with something that's more concrete, defined at an engineering level, exactly what it does, how it works, and even the client side. It can't just be AP side. You should probably also think of the client. Would you enable automatic protection of a network against rogue APs? I would. Yeah. However, you've got to be careful, right? I can't disrupt my neighbors. So unless you have solid policies in place that the definition of your rogue AP is clear to you and the other network admins, and you carefully monitor manually the manual systems, for rogue AP detection, for authorized clients, et cetera, then, yeah, I say you have to turn it on. In, in WatchGuard's case and, and uh, uh, in Arista's case as well, uh, we use a technology that, that allows us to, to say definitively, absolutely, this is an authorized AP, this is a neighbor AP. If you're not a friend and you're not a neighbor, then you're the bad guy. And if you're the bad guy and I'm within the constraints, the confines of my building, I can do pr practically anything I want to to you and not break the law. I love this next one, Jim. Shouldn't HTTPS SSL be enough to protect your data in an evil twin scenario? Uh, we did this, I did this live at RSA a couple years back. Um, go to Better Cap, Better Cap. And you'll, you'll, you'll learn all about uh, SSL stripping and then SSL stripping with HSTS bypass. So your web browsers, they're getting smarter now, but they know that if you try to access a website and you're not typing HTTPS right in front of it, uh, that it will, it's, it has a database lookup of, oh, you know, Facebook should actually reply back, even though you hit port 80, it should reply back 443. That's HSTS. HSTS bypass is when the man in the middle is also running a DNS server, and it's resolving bogus domains, bogus FQDNs. So, at RSA, what I was showing was grabbing Facebook passwords and Office 365 passwords from being a man in the middle. The client was requesting www.facebook.com, and the man in the middle was resolving facebook.com to the legitimate actual website and presenting it back in the plain text format. So it was stripping all the SSL off. It's true, no one's beat SSL quite yet, right? But that's a, that's a trick that if you're running processing power that man the middle machine can actually strip that off not every website works it's getting better but it's still an issue this is a comment uh wp3 needs a transition mode because of older clients that won't or cannot support it uh will this mean that it's even less secure and more liable to be attacked yeah google, google the article that we wrote on this we said wpa3 is probably less secure because of that downgrade backwards compatibility um isn't 802.11w mandatory in WPA3 and OWE? You know, I honestly can't remember whether it is or not. Keith, is it? Is it? It is? Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. You had us on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I just couldn't remember. Yeah. Okay. I've got a quick question over here. Yeah. Uh, this is actually on behalf of JJ, who had to step out for a second. How do you reconcile your recommendations for OTA remediation against the FCC's ruling that organizations don't own their airspace? So the FCC is obviously right. They do. They make the rules. However, if the airspace around me, if I have a client um, that is, or a, uh, a threat that is placed against my network or my client, then I have uh, the right, the legal right, to be able to stop those particular threats. Now, in the case where I, I'm in my environment and I have authorized clients, I can prevent my clients from, attack, from attaching to an evil twin. In other words, if I'm allowed, I can go and, and de-auth my own clients and force them back to my network. 
I think. What and it's it's consent too. By the way, uh, uh, splash pages are important. That little we I call it weasel claws <laughs> is very important. So for for public Wi-Fi, splash pages are really important. Uh, we've looked at that uh, for for corporate office. Generally, the IT policy is very important. So there is an overarching FCC rule that you, you can't fight that. But if you're uh, if you're a hotspot operator in the public area, that splash page verbiage is actually really critical. And if you're uh, in Europe or operate in Europe, <laughs> probably more critical. Not related to FCC at all, right? But privacy concerns, that's coming, becoming more and more of an issue. Good question. All right, anything, anything else? Cool. Thank you all. All right, thanks everyone. Hopefully get